I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our Language of Wisdom study group led by Jerry Northrup, also with Daniel Friedman, Kirby Erner. And today's topic is God. God as the elephant. The elephant we don't always talk about. So um, we'll have introductory remarks by Jerry. Okay. Yeah, this this stems from uh, the fact that I've been really trying to uh, to dig into understanding uh, what Andreas has written about the the onesome and the uh, twosome, and I keep finding it um, confusing. I believe that the symbolic structure of wondrous wisdom is profound and it's very important, um, but in terms of, of how I can understand some elements of it, how I could explain this to other people is, is becoming very confusing to me. And I think this, this relates back to, if you look at the one sum as a boundary, uh, then that for me implies an internal structure of some sort, uh, which uh, I, I don't understand how that's dealt with in, in the current descriptions of, of the oneness. So I think this goes back to the foundations of where we start. And I start with a notion of personal experience being what I know, who I am, and kind of go from there. Andreas, as I understand it, starts with an understanding of God. And that is considerably different because I basically have always considered myself to be an atheist. I, I don't really understand um, God. And I've, I've read what Andreas has talked about with, is, is God necessary? And to me, the answer is, is no, it's neither necessary or useful as a concept. Now, I understand that that's not the case for a lot of other people. Uh, and I don't have a problem with, with that aspect of it. But I, I do have a question um, that I want to talk about as to how much um, do I need to understand on how you understand God before I can start to understand what your findings are and what I would need to know to try to replicate your findings relative to the structure. So I think it, it's, um, it comes back to this um, fundamental notion there of, uh, you know, we have a fundamental difference. I don't think it, it impacts uh, the discovery of, of this incredibly interesting symbolic formalism that you use in one form and I use in another form and that I want to continue to explore that dialogue. But I would like to get some better understanding as to exactly what you mean by God and how that, uh, how that to see if I can make some sense as, as to how that would, would play in what I think. So I'll respond, and then I'll be asking uh, Kirby and Daniel, maybe they can help to explain how they see these things, because I think that um, those different angles uh, could be uh, very relevant, important, helpful here. But I think uh, maybe to specify a little bit, like my, as you said, your starting point, uh, you, you've said is uh, language and consciousness, and let's say, as through your personal experience, uh, I've read your... Um, uh, your intellectual autobiography, uh, where it's almost it's like reading Descartes, I guess, a little bit, where you, you just proceed uh, based on the fact that you are and what you you know what seems most uh, at hand in your life in your thinking. Uh, so for me, um, uh, and and the question is, you know, we we both have these languages of wisdom. Uh, yours is the relational symmetry paradigm. I call mine wondrous wisdom. Uh, we. Uh, noticed, uh, you noticed uh, that we we came up with very uh, with structures that seem quite similar, but as, uh, that was a year ago we we met and now we're kind of realizing like they seem quite similar. They have some similarity, but we came at that in very different directions. So it's a real challenge for us to understand each other. So you're understanding yourself as a person uh, among people. That's why you can have language. That's why, you know, when you think of consciousness, it's consciousness between different people. All. It's almost polytheistic, so to speak, in the sense that there are many people, there's many beings, there's many gods, so to speak. Uh, whereas my starting point was um, I wanted to know everything uh, because I wanted to understand, let's say, the foundations. I wanted to understand things as they truly are. 
Uh, and without that, it just didn't seem very meaningful to proceed. You know, I just have this hunger to know, but to really to know it all completely and to know it truly and, you know, with well-founded way. So then I don't have that knowledge. Uh, it's not really available anywhere to anybody. Uh, so the question is, what would it mean to have that type of knowledge? You know, what is that? Where is, you know, what is that like? So because I was raised a Catholic and raised a believer in the Christian faith, the Christian worldview, um, but also with a scientific worldview, even as a child, uh, interested. Uh, so this idea, though, of God was uh, familiar and seemed relevant in the sense, not so much God himself or herself, but this idea that, oh, what does God see? You know, like God knows everything, can do everything, can see everything, right? So this relationship between God and everything is very intimate. And ultimately, the idea that, well, and sometimes, uh, especially when I was like 17, 18, everything would be like a stand-in for God. You know, maybe like a neutral word or a neutral concept that didn't have these theological, let's say, connotations or over overtones. But it, it, as things kind of uh, hashed out, uh, this idea that, well, Everything is the structure of God. God is the spirit of everything. So they're related. Like technically, like everything would be the division of everything into one perspective. But you could also have the division of everything into no perspectives. So God doesn't need a perspective. And so when I look at my structures, um, and when I'm looking at trying to understand everything, the basic structures that I uh, encountered were ways of carving up mental space. You know, I have a mind. How do I carve up the mental space? And so uh, carving it up in terms of perspectives seemed very helpful. Like, for example, if you imagine uh, neurologically, uh, neurologically, our brains have a map of the body. OK, so they've actually found, you know, this map of the body. And what's very interesting, it's very plastic. So like if you pick up a hammer, your body grows longer. OK. If you drive in a car, you feel if somebody drives too close. You know, it's like you're, you physically, what you consider physically, what you, your space, your private zone or whatever, that changes depending on the body map. And people can have damage to their body map and they can have missing limbs that they think are there. All kinds of things, you know, can happen. So imagine if there was a mind map in the brain. You know, the brain had a map of the mind. How are the resources being used? You know, what is the mind up to, right? So what I'm doing with these divisions of everything are very much like what the mind map would be organizing. It could say uh, everything is divided up into two zones right now. We've divided everything up into two zones or three zones or four zones or five zones or six zones and so on. OK, or seven zones. And when you get to eight zones, it goes back to, let's say, zero zones. And the 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 the, the brain could have a map where it says. Uh, oh, the mind has no perspectives right now. The mind is kind of like disconnected right now. You see, it says no perspectives. Right. So there's, a, of course, this is all taking place in some kind of little map in the brain. You know, I'm saying it's like an eight cycle. OK. But so that the when the brain, you know, when the brain or the mind, you know, it monitors itself, right? It has this map of itself, right? So what would the kind of things be in that map? You see? So it's very holistic. It's about carving things up. So it's not about numbers as addition. You know, like when you talk about systems, you see the systems are on the table. So first of all, you already, like you say, like you said, it's a thing, right? Like it's it's got a context. You're ignoring the context. It's in a box. You're studying what's in the box. You're studying how things in the box are related. You know, one system A, system B, they're related. So this is saying, no, it's saying we're describing us. We're describing the context. We're describing what's going on with us. So it's not addition to say, well, one and then another one is two and then another one is three. No, it's about division, you see, dividing everything into two. So dividing everything into everything. And those divisions are going to be, they're dividing contradiction. So so let's maybe just to, and then I'll maybe ask uh, Daniel and Kirby, maybe they could explain what they are able to. But see, if you think of God as a, well, I want to say, first of all, like how to think of God from my point of view, I, even as a child, you know, because I was kind of maybe skeptical, but, you know, believing, but skeptical, but like, how do you think? So 
also the ability to have multiple tracks in the mind that you can pursue different it's difficult but you know you kind of different train tracks in your mind you pursue things in parallel different ways so one thing i realized as a child um because these ideas would come up well you know people don't believe in god you don't have to believe in god you know etc so i did think about having an open mind though and i go which would be look it's not about God, it's about the possibility of God. Would I rule out the possibility of God? You see, I can, if I can rule it out, that's one option. That's a hardcore atheist, rules it out. There's no God. Or I cannot rule out the possibility of God. You see, there's no third choice. That's a, that's a yes or no. Like Either you rule it out or you don't rule it out. If you don't rule it out, then God is possible. It doesn't say that God is actual. It doesn't say that God is necessary. But it says that you haven't ruled him out. Now, which introduces biases, right? Like, you know, to introduce, it's problematic. Like, you, there's a bias in there. But which bias is stronger? Rejecting the possibility or allowing for it? So even as a child, I said, I don't have a choice, but I will rather allow for the possibility than reject it. You see. So maybe I'll even add, like, well, maybe I'll, we'll move on to some support. But just to say, like, so first of all, it's about the possibility of God. Nothing really too much depends on actually there being a God. It's about the possibility. But once there's a possibility, you can play with it. You can imagine it. Or you can even in your life depend on it. So um, when I wrote that paper, um, or I gave that presentation, actually, uh, about... Uh, and I gave it in China um, at the in the philosophy of religion section of the Congress of World Philosophy. But I gave it, it's not about saying there is a God. It's not about saying that God is necessary. It's just saying like describing, imagining God, that our ability to imagine God is very limited. And the only thing I could imagine God doing is that God would ask this question, am I necessary? And so then you can see that simple question and it's not a verbal question, it's just like an attitude. And it leads to two different, it leads to like a proof by contradiction. So like if proof by contradiction says, well, if there is a God, then there is a God. That's the easy part. But there's another parallel track. If there's not a God, suppose there's not a God, then if there, you know, if God exists, there should still be a God. Even if there's not a God, you would end up with God. So you get this division of, logical division into two tracks into two possibilities the first we call the spiritual world you just presume god then that's easy there's just god is there it's not very interesting the second one would be the material world the material world has no god you know the material world's clearly like godless but the idea is okay but so if god exists if if god exists then god somehow comes out even in a material world has to creep out OK, I'm not saying he does or he doesn't, but I'm just saying that's what the proof of contradiction would look like in the case of God. And that's basically the only thing I can imagine God doing. You know, a real God, let's say, would, you know, who's like primordial, who's not kind of like got all this extra stuff, but just a real God would have those things. And see, so that's like a division of everything into two parts where one, the interesting part is like, well, opposites coexist, let's say. God is not, but God is. The other one, it's all the same, just presumes God is. So. So that's, see, when you kind of think in this crazy way, that's the kind of crazy way you have to think in order to be able to think of carving up the mind in different uh, zones or rooms, like a house with different rooms. That's, that's maybe Kirby or Daniel, I don't know if you can explain how it looks from your point of view, but, but Jerry, so what do you think of that? Is that helpful? Well, most of what you're saying there makes a lot of sense in terms of, of mental space, carving up how we think and, and view things mentally. Um, and then when you get to the point, well, maybe there is something more, this possibility of God, because everybody, you hear about God, you talk to other people and that sort of stuff, um, then how you'd go from that point on, um, I could say there's a possibility of God, um, but it has no, no meaning or utility for me. That's not so what I, it's about, a utility, I mean. But the point is, like, that's a real division of everything into two possibilities, like of life. Like, you can reject God entirely. Yeah. Just, I mean, yeah. reject God, the possibility. There is not any right. possibility. Or you can say, I don't reject the possibility. Yeah. Now, among those two, 
The one that you don't reject the possibility, that actually takes more energy. It's more ambiguous because there could be a God or not a God. You just haven't taken a position on the question, right? Like, you see, so no, that's, I... that's, that actually takes more energy, but you don't, you keep more options open. So the mind can move from that to rejection. But see, once mm -hmm. you've rejected God, you know, you're not going to go back. That's the issue. Yeah. It's a one-way street. I... I, I can admit to the possibility of God. I just don't think it's particularly relevant, so I don't have any much time on it. Yeah, so that's a different thing. But see, the what I'm trying to say is like this is an example of what a division of everything is. It's like there's these two different worlds you can live in. You you and you happen to live. I mean, we live in both. You know, we think in both. The question is, is that you know you can step into one, you can step into the other. But if you step into one, it'll slide over. It can slide over to the other one, but you don't slide back. But the point is, is that every so often we get rebooted. Anytime we deal with existence, we have a type of question like this. It's going to have like these two worlds views and the relationship between them. Well, yeah, if you say it, it still doesn't seem to be something that the uh, takes up very much time or consideration. I mean, if you say, okay, so that that you've totally rejected God, but maybe you reboot, and I can see that as if you you totally rejected God, say I'm a complete atheist and that sort of stuff, and then some kind of horrendous thing happens uh, that you can't understand, and that reintroduces the question, so you reboot your, your structure to see. You, well, and it could be just simply as you wake up the next morning, you have a different attitude. Like, so... This yeah. is just describing the, the state of mind at a particular, let's say, moment, yeah. in, you know, episode in time. In a certain episode, right. I'm in this framework. And then if I become conscious of myself, I would go from, let's say, existence to decision making because I would add three perspectives. So now I'm in a different episode of my life, you know, where maybe for five minutes or half a minute or 10 minutes, you know, I'm decision making. And then I would go over to logic, let's say, right? So there's this whole shifting of episodes of the, what the kind of episode the mind is in. And you can shift by adding one perspective, that's an unconscious shift. You can shift by adding two perspectives, that's a conscious shift. You can shift by adding three perspectives, that's consciousness shift. So you have these shifts. And I, I don't have them all figured out. I mean, that's just the hypothesis, that's the working hypothesis like it sounds. So right. that's why I'm studying block periodicity to see like, how do these shifts work? I don't know. Yeah. I guess in a certain sense, it's an allocation of time issue. For me, very little time spent on that kind of consideration. Well, the point being that this is this isn't really about God. That, that was a matter of division of the two parts for existence. So okay. existence issues are coming up all the time. You know, like yeah. J J Kirby Daniel, what are your thoughts, sir? Welcome. Kirby, you can go for it, or I can give short thoughts. Um, well, I took some notes. I'll, I'll quickly say where I'm at. I notice a lot, like I'm, I'm wearing the sociology hat because that's the study group I'm in. You know, I haven't joined physics yet. I like to down the road sometime. So I'm in sociology, and I look at God as it, it's – become more obvious to me as I've grown older, a role that God plays in people's giving thanks and praising and offering prayer. They don't want to do it to other humans. In other words, I don't want to thank my co-sponsors. I don't want to thank my peers. I don't want to thank other human beings for the life that I have. I mean, sure, my mother gave birth, but she doesn't create her own self in other words we don't make our own bodies we haven't i think of the ego as wishing to be smarter and greater in its knowledge of the world and it's surrounded by a world that is already way more intelligent than we are and this is not an argument of god the watchmaker therefore god exists because evidence of higher intelligence than human I just think it, at some point humans need to express their admiration and shared sense that they are somewhat contained within 
something more intelligent than they are because we can't even figure out how to make humans. We're born into the world, but we don't have the blueprints. We can't design life. We don't know how to create life. We don't know how to do shit. So humans, I have a strong misanthropic um, streak. I've balanced it. I'm also a philanthropist. But I think that we see God kind of from a standpoint of lower, and that's good. It gives us humility. And it also depends a lot of, you know, abstract philosophical arguments about God do center on does God exist or not. But from a sociological point of view, again, I think it's mentally healthy for humans to look up to the higher intelligence that is obvious, maybe not to personify and think of it as a person. And in fact, in that department, I really do think we have to talk about God as belonging to individuals because they're responsible. So when Andreas talks, we hear about his God. And when Spinoza talks, we hear about his God. And when Bucky Fuller talks, we hear about his God. And so I always want to bring back God to somebody. It belongs to somebody, the God we're talking about. It's somewhat irresponsible to cut God loose and say, no, I don't mean any human's God. I mean God, God. I mean the God above all gods. I know what you mean, but no human is really authorized to speak for that God. I don't give anyone credit. No one's accredited in my universe to speak for God. That's why I have God. So I don't have to listen to grovelly little grubby little gross little human beings about stuff that's important. Humans are not that important. I don't need to learn from them. You know, that kind of feeling. Uh, and I'll finish it off by saying um, we can just say nature has a higher IQ than human beings. That would be enough for me. And I, I know Andrea said in an earlier email, just think of a bigger, big picture. Like however your big picture, however big your big picture is of the universe, you can easily imagine a bigger picture and you can project on the future. You can say humans in a thousand years will look back on us and say, we had such picky knowledge. We were so undeveloped. We knew, knew so little. That's kind of a God's eye point of view. If you can project yourself a thousand years in the future and look back on us, that's getting closer to God's perspective, I would say. You are long dead and gone. That's the way God sees you, in my view. You died thousands of years ago. And everything's the way it was, right? It's not important that we change the future because it's already passed, something like that. All right, I'll stop at that point. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah, all, all, all great comments. Uh, I think of several of the speeches in Hamlet and also in particular one dual work by William Blake. There is no natural religion. All religions are one. This kind of dual pamphlet that characterizes like all religions are one is kind of Andreas's position. Like all things must be cleaved from an upper, you know, oneness. What, what other arena could host the diversity of thought so it's and then that's so it's a kind of a top-down perspective using that metaphor of up and down and then um the 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 other side of that little tiny pamphlet book is uh there is no natural religion which is just like well each cognitive agent surely constructs its own umwelt worldview etc 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 just materially so the idea that they have like privileged or or veridical access is highly dubious if not just blatantly empirically disproven moment to moment in the eyes of some and yet others see that divergence with the bottom up um, realization of divergence like oh well these horses look different so how could there be a essential platonic horse and uh the, the question of like well what else is needed if anything 
what do we need? What else is needed to connect the dots? And like carving up sp space of minds and talking about the diversity of minds. For some people, this concept or that concept in, in English or another language or 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 a non um, linguistic language or anything, that concept might be like they're like machete slash laser beam slash superpower. And yet in the hands of another, it would be like just totally off base and and very distasteful. Again, that speaks to cognitive diversity, even within forms that are like roughly similar in all of this. And I just, uh, from a, yeah, there's a lot of other ways to go, but how to go from agnosticism or or just it could be but it could be can't be used to say that it is or it isn't so how how can one go from a from uncertainty to to certainty and then um in what ways is that justified to, to people to themselves and to others So those are some of the thoughts. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Kirby. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to add, add one yes. thing. Since I, I didn't quite get the full sociology of it, I think if I'm going to buy into God talk and start using it, in other words, if I'm going to get in front of people at a podium, let's just imagine, you know, Kirby's talking and Kirby's going to talk about God. What's Kirby going to say? I'm likely to bring in a lot of biblical stuff because I find God becomes more useful mm -hmm. as he gets rolled up in stories like Genesis. And I find what's interesting about God talk and what a lot of people use it for is a kind of psychotherapy because we're looking at God who's who rested on the seventh day. And yet the action in some sense doesn't stop. I would say the seventh day includes this whole soap opera with human beings like we're not finished yet. God created humanity, that's still in our future. We're not done. And he has a very problematic relationship with humans. There's the Garden of Eden episode, they get cast out. Then there's the whole flood. He have, wipes out humanity. And then says, wait, I'm not going to do that again. And gives a promise. But then humanity still fucks up. Humanity goes on from Noah chapter into, okay, there's very few people to begin with. There's just the sons and wives of the sons supposedly those create the races a lot of bullshit like that but they all think the same this is the big human failing we we're mass like ants we're prone to group think and we all start thinking the same way we all start marching to the same drummer and that's the tower of babel story humans all got it into their heads that they can get closer to god if they build a really tall tower and God is like smacking his forehead and like, yet again, humans are problematic. They're not really very smart, are they? And so what did God do? He'd promised not to wipe them out again. So he comes in and confuses their tongues. And I would say that was a great psyop on God's part to make sure that humans are incapable of total groupthink. There's always going to be this divergence. We're not going to be on the same page. And that is ordained by God, because as soon as we all think alike, we're dumb. We're dumb, and we're done for. Like, if we have a big nuclear war coming up, it's because too many people think the same way. That's the biggest threat to humanity, is commonality and thought. So Andreas always thinks I'm always pushing for differences, always picking fights. In a way, that's true. I don't want us to all be on the same page. I'm on God's side. I would make one one comment here to go back to what Daniel was talking a little bit about the concept of uncertainty. I'm very comfortable with indeterminacy and uncertainty. So I can say there's all kinds of stuff I don't know that um, can be all kinds of ways and I can just leave it at that. I can say, I don't know. It's, it's indeterminate, it's uncertain. I'm comfortable with that. I'll deal with what I can directly experience and, and know. So 
thank you all for the diversity we have. Um, and a, a few thoughts come to mind. Um, one is in terms of the culture of our community of uh, wondrous wisdom and math wisdom. And in that culture, which is kind of a work in progress, but um, God is as relevant. So that means that um, it's typically not about God because a lot of things aren't about God. Um, but I always want to feel that like God is invited, you know, as a fellow investigator. Uh, and uh, I always, uh, I do like to pray at the end just because, uh, just to kind of like have that connection to say, you know, we're, we're meant to here in our culture to be operating on that level that would be relevant for God, you know, where like God would have something to do, you know, or at least God would be kind of like include, like God's relevant. It's about the big picture. It's about that. Uh, so as relevant, so as relevant means like, why are we talking about God today? I go back to what Daniel said last week that uh, sometimes the most basic thing to talk about uh, more, even more basic than the two, some three, some four, some, or the three minds or, the most basic thing is these parables, uh, narratives, metaphors, aphorisms that are lurking maybe in me, you know, that got me to think this way, right? Or that kind of was necessary to make these. Things. So I tend not to go there too much, but I think it's good if you can help drag that out of me, like what's useful. And also like what's useful, like if Kirby or Dan, you know, you know explaining these things, you know, um, in these next four months, I hope to be writing a paper uh, and submitting this paper for philosophy and mind sciences journal on their issue on structuralism and consciousness. And so part of that paper, it'll be very helpful if in this group, you know, we flesh out more like what's helpful in understanding these things. What are the unspoken things that need to be said? So that's where that's why we're talking about God today, you see. And so um, uh, God's also relevant, like in terms of the big the theory. Like, so this idea that, well, uh, one thing is the facts. So like Jerry and I kind of uh, well, almost agree on certain facts, certain structures. Those are things we came up with. That's just documenting the human experience. But how do you make sense of it? So then God is a vantage point, one possible among many, like where it could help make sense of it. And so the sum of the wisdom I have is this aphorism, uh, God does not have to be good, you see which is a little bit more complicated than that, saying like, you know, if you want to, life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding that God does not have to be good. Like if you want to live forever and grow forever and learn forever, you have to have this mindset that uh, God and good are two different things. Good is conditional, God is beyond condition, and they're just not going to always fit. If you want to grow, you're going to have to see the disconnect. So, and just to cite the Bible, uh, not to uh, lean on the Bible as much as maybe Deborah Gordon with her the ants, but uh, to, uh, you know, I, I was kind of shocked that that seemed to be the evidence for her. <laughs> but of course, beautiful Bible quote. But the Bible quote I would uh, that I kind of like uh, find solace in um, is at the Last Supper. Um, of course, this is the, the Christian scriptures. But um, the Last Supper, um, Jesus said, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will tell you all things. So first of all, like, it means that it could be possible to know everything <laughs> from at least from like Jesus' point of view. That's kind of reassuring. Like, you know, if I want to do that, it's not the same going against God, you know, or that I'm going against the Tower of Babel story or whatever, right? Like, number one. But number two, um, you need to go back to that. I remember this God does not have to be good, you know, etc. And that's a shocking thing to kind of like draw that conclusion. But then several years later, I noticed he said, I have much more to tell you, but I you cannot bear it now. And then I thought, yeah, imagine if you would have said, you know, I have much more to tell you. God does not have to be good. <laughs> you see, like, I just don't think that that was maybe the right moment for him to say something like this. You see? So then it all makes more sense. So there's lots of um, things in the scriptures which are kind of um, encouraging in the sense that you uh, you go, oh, I think I understood what he was talking about or what they were talking about or et cetera. You know, it's it's sometimes very like, for example, um, to think, oh, the days of Genesis, what do they mean? You know, oh, those are divisions of everything. You know, for God, a day is an event. What is an event for God? Well, 
God divided everything into a new way, you know, or a new way, right? Like, so, and then the seventh day is the final day, and then it's all over, you see. So that's just, that doesn't teach you anything. It doesn't explain, but it's just kind of like a friendly thing. There's nothing wrong with what I'm thinking. It's not against the Bible, you see. So. Thank you. I think that represents like an internal out view, which is one sense of coherence is internal consistency like within the epistemic statuses of given scriptures and translations and then there's the view from the outside and like external justification and some of the fundamental challenges that come into play in like perspectival harmonization even in our earthly realm like relating to incompleteness theorem and all this other stuff mm -hmm. So then it's like, well, from the inside out, in a sense, like even though there's uncertainties, in a way, there's like faith in those uncertainties, like the cognitive buck does stop somewhere as realized. And then we are in positions to also consider like latent and hypothetical abduced spaces that help us describe patterns and regularities in um algae population mm -hmm. and in quantum particles and all these empirical things where math is unreasonably effective and and you mentioned girdles and completeness theory but just this idea like see when you have your internal just direction and you're able to feel that you can push forward despite, you know, the kind of like horrible obstacles you can see. When you push forward, um, then you start to uh, notice that it's not all dark in the woods, you know, like, so for example, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, it is a mathematical statement that's kind of like on the table, like it's kind of like explicit, it's that external view. But we don't live life that way. Like the way we live, the, the human experience is not a axiomatized system. It's a system that's kind of unfolding and in process, you see. And if you look at the mathematical system that you live through subjectively and it's being pulled together subjectively, like, first of all, we don't have to have a problem living in a state of contradiction. You know, that's not necessarily a problem for us, you know, as a model for, so and the divisions are basically built on that. But second of all, like, uh, when you analyze something like Gödel's incompleteness theorem in terms of a system that is kind of like built on the fly, it just comes out differently. It's not such a, it's really not so problematic as it might seem. But what I really want to say, though, is that um, the beauty of us having our different um, just life views, world views, theological views, you know, existential views, is that we get to contribute things from different perspectives upon the same reality, I think. So that's why like, it was very exciting a year ago uh, to start collecting those relationships with truth. Because if we all have different relationships with truth, we're all having the privilege of seeing things and investing ourselves in the view from different places, which is relevant. So like when I want to learn verbalization, argumentation, three languages, why have I not made progress? Because I have not probably thought in terms of there are independent beings who have a language who are trying to speak to each other. I have not immersed myself in that kind of thinking enough, which is so I can draw, let's say, from Jerry, you from, you know, in terms of trying to make progress on that, because you just have a different investment, right? And so if we could, that's sometimes like in the future, maybe what I'd like to show how connect with people on their relationship with truth and then to say, okay. So why is God relevant? What does God look like from different positions on that math? You see, like starting with truth. Maybe just to make it a little bit more concrete, there's something called the transcendentals. Um, this was in scholasticism in the ancient Greeks. And it's basically um, beauty, good, true. You know, the beautiful, the good, and the true. I, and I collect things like that, but I never could make sense of it. It just seems so scattered, you see. It just didn't make any sense. So for decades, I never... But just, I think, maybe yesterday, uh, I looked at that and I go, oh, if you think of the unconscious, conscious, consciousness, you see, what do they value? Like, the unconscious values the beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, you know, in terms of the impression, right? Like, the conscious values the good. Okay, something that maybe 
just functionally meaningful, useful, good. And the consciousness values the harmony between those two. So truth is like the harmony between the, 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 the content and the form, you know, or the, 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 the conscious and the unconscious, you know. So I remember just falling in, you know, falling in love or the, the person I would fall in love with, the sweetheart, she'd be, I'd want her to be good and beautiful. I wanted her to look the way she is. <laughs> and so that desire is a desire for the truth, let's say, right? So all three things kind of like come into me. Not, not that I got me anywhere. But just an example, um, one is like where uh, there's a conceptual structure out there. It takes me decades to figure out, oh, I think now I understand where what it's, you know, where 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 it fits in the system. Uh, I feel pretty happy about that. But but another is that um, well, just saying maybe about the truth, like how truth can be a guide to these godly things, uh, where you know, like you can be blind to beauty, you can be uh, not prejudiced, you know, not not uh, not not knowledgeable of what's good, but you can be interested in how they fit together. That's like what the consciousness is. Oh, but maybe the point about me, though, maybe there is something special, like if we all have these different things to contribute to this map, you know, of the relationship of truth, whatever, at least the one who believes in God so, you know, absolutely and directly, or maybe believes the wrong word, but who imagines, you know, plays with us, you know, grapples with this idea, you know, because you can just not care, but I'm grappling it with consistently. So that's why I would be a person who cares about that map who says, hey, that map is real. So he says, hey, we could be all working together, you see, in a deep way, not it. So I think that's the special role I may be contributing, is to say, uh, yeah, absolute truth is a meeting ground for all our different uh, uh, things that we could be contributing. I got to sign on to that. I think that's a good motive. I think historically, you know, the Quaker story, they grow up in the time of great religious wars and fighting, and a lot of it is theologically based. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther attacks, there's Reformation, Counter-Reformation, and at some point people just kind of had enough of theological disputes as a source of schisms so the quakers i don't know i don't know if i should say original with them because you can find it in other groups but they made silence uh sacred and the highest form of worship was to sit in silence with your other humans i know when andreas came to portland we went to a quaker meeting nearby i've got one in walking distance they just sat there for a whole hour. I can't remember if anyone spoke, but you're allowed to, if you come, you you can give a message to the group. But an advantage of this approach is you don't have any theological tests for your level of participation. In other words, the clerk of the meeting, or, you know, there are many positions, many roles, kind of like we have here. There's steering committees, oversight committees, blah, blah. But we don't sit around and talk about who believes what and so on, because we don't really know. It's like we've kind of been trained not to indulge, you could say, in theological debate. And so we don't consider that as, you know, it's more like, does this person have the right social skills? Can they make coffee? Let's put them on the social committee. Oh, but they don't believe in God. Well, who cares? That's that's just humans thinking. That's just humans, what they think. Believe in God, don't believe in God. That's just, who cares? That's just humans. Kind of like that. It's kind of the feeling. I think uh, that silence so is part of our culture. Then, you know, also it's a form of prayer that we would recognize uh, whenever someone wants to lead us in silence. But um, also this idea, like I said, like God as relevant, you know, so, um, you know, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> uh, but so in the wondrous wisdom, though, there is a lot to say about God that hopefully could be, you know, worked out and meaningful. Like we have a lot of other things to work out. But uh, 
But one of the things that does seem, where it does seem to go, it's saying that the whole point, it's about thinking about things from God's point of view in as much as we can imagine it. But one of the points is that for God to grow, it's about becoming somebody's God. And so becoming God for each of us, you know. And so uh, exactly kind of like I think what uh, Kirby was saying, like it's not about being the... It's about being a personal God for each of us, like in the in their own way. And so that's what makes God meaningful or real or kind of like grown or whatever. But the, for each person, that seems to be the relevant choice. Like, am I living in my, am I applying things to myself or to this higher vantage point? Like in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they have the, you know, the higher, the higher power or whatever. Like it doesn't have to be, it's as much defined as you need it to be, but um people have that that choice does seem existentially important it does seem to come out from these structures and as in that overview it, of wondrous wisdom it's like english as each person has it and english as a language or right a person as each person happens to know them in in the in their facets or the integrated you know time caterpillar is it unity and multiplicity and slash or the opposite phrase and about approaching from a multiplicity convergence towards unity as a kind of con unity as a consequence but but then it's like an mc escher with the hands drawing each other because like well surely your concept of everything is happening in your mind but your mind can only be truly happening you know as far as we understand in this prerequisite setting and so it's like that is the dialogue and and different people may handle that kind of criticality and then spin off in a given way, which is highly cultural. Yeah, it can be very cultural, sure. But I think it's, I hang out a, a lot with the, he was president of the humanists for a, quite a few years. Now he's, they've got term limits or whatever, but good friend of mine, Dave Danucci. But, you know, one of, the, he's, he's very, um, cares about people and he, he, he's a very good guy, I would say, in terms of what he does, but he's not a believer and kind of a slogan kind of a billboard slogan for the humanists is good without God. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're proud. They're proud. You could say in their heart of hearts, they feel morally superior to Christians because they don't even need God to be good. Whereas these Christians are going around thinking eternal punishment or I'll go to hell or God is watching me. I better be good or else. Whereas humanists say, no, we don't need or else. We're not afraid of any God. We don't think about God, but we're good. And we're just as good as Christians, that kind of thing. So there's this competition to be good. And at some point in Western civilization, it became feasible to espouse goodness without allegiance to any particular God. And it is very difficult, I would say, linguistically to divide God from political authorities, going back to my opening remarks about you want to be free from tyranny, and a lot of people use God that way, but a lot of people use God the other way. Like, if you're against the state, or if you don't worship the right priests or whatever, then you're against God, you're a heretic, you're disobedient, we have to throw you out, excommunication, all these punishments. So there is a reaction to that. And I think it helps to understand the story of Western civilization to realize that with the emergence of science and think for yourself and do your own experiments gave permission to a lot of people to just turn their back on a certain cast of authority figure, people who dress up in priestly uniforms, people who look like the Pope. And they just said, I'm not going to listen to them. They're not my gods. They're not my authorities, but other people never went through that. And they feel great allegiance to institutions of religion and they're they're good catholics and they think that's a good thing and there are other people who look down on that because they think oh you need god huh for you
Well, we're almost concluding. Any last thoughts from, uh, and then then I'll maybe say a prayer and then we'll end, but uh, Jerry? Uh, I'm just gonna keep plugging away at, at uh, trying to uh, express the foundations the way I see them and how that may or may not map into how you see them. And so you'll so, write us for next time. It's I'll, so I'll write up a thing and hopefully I'll get some um, some diagrams to illustrate that. So Daniel. And so this helped you kind of see this idea of carving space and whatever is I don't know if this was helpful, but uh, I, I think it's helpful. I just need to digest it. I'm a, a slow thinker nowadays. That's what this is all about thinking, not too fast, not running ahead, thinking slow. Uh, slowing the mind down, seeing the possibilities. Sometimes there aren't too many. Uh, so I'll pray uh, to God um, just to thank you uh, for the space you give us, the freedom you give us, uh, the loving environment that we have uh, in which we're able to think so freely and about the things we care about. Uh, some maybe petty, some maybe bigger, but I think basically you can see that we really are trying to make the most of our lives uh, and to join in others. And so to appreciate also that uh, we're glad um, when you are relevant uh, and so that we can always uh, have that connection with you, that uh, uh, with, as with a parent who loves us more than we love ourselves, and to feel that we can always, um, you, you're, all, you're very close. So we can, uh, as relevant, you're always here for us to think about, to be with, and, and to uh, speak to, and to hear from. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. Let me tell you, you go to Patreon, real easy to do. You find Math for Wisdom, real easy to do. You sign up, two or three minutes, it's done. That easy to do. And you will be a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter, like I am.